What's going on guys, it's Bromley with Empire Barbell and today I wanna to talk about specialization, specifically in the way that different lifters will specialize in different physical qualities pertaining to either power development or muscular endurance. This has some implications for the way you train and how you structure your training and rotate through different qualities over time. So it's important that you guys have a concept of the difference and the ways which you can kind of bias towards one or the other. So we're gonna use an extreme example involving a pretty famous interaction between a world champion powerlifter and world champion bodybuilder. To start out with this chart, this curve right here, we have percentage against reps. And this curve right here is kind of a best fit line for where most lifters, people like you and me that have been training for a bit, have a certain amount of strength and are somewhat well-rounded in our training, this is where we tend to fall. So starting out, we have 100%, 10% for the average person tends to be between 70 and 75%. That's very common. And then as you get further along, you get further away from where we specialize. We tend to specialize in this heavy range because we think that's where all the gains are, right? So as you get further along out of your comfort zone, this is where we are untrained. And eventually you run into this asymptote. This is like kind of a theoretical limit line here of, of where we can go. Because if you don't train beyond a certain rep capacity, it doesn't matter how much weight's on the bar, you're going to gas out. Just, weight can be zero. You could just be doing body weight squats. If you're keeping a steady pace, eventually you're gonna burn out. If you're not conditioned to it, that rep is not going to be very high. So what we have are examples of people who are more specialized to volume and rep capacity and people who are more specialized to power development. So now that we have this idea of what we're charting, I'm gonna tell you this story. At FIBO, it's a trade show in Germany, in 1993, you had Tom Platt face off against Fred Hatfield, all right? It's a golden eagle against Dr. Squat. Tom Platt was a bodybuilder who absolutely revolutionized the sport by having a manic obsession with just obliterating his legs. The guy was a masochist. He was known for his brutal leg workouts. The end result of that were thighs that were just unseen in bodybuilding. And he really changed the standard for expectation for leg development. Fred Hatfield, on the other hand, was a world champion powerlifter. A lot of people credit him with the first thousand pound squat. It wasn't, he wasn't, it was Lee Moran, but still is a thousand pound squatter nonetheless. It was back in the day before equipped and raw were like two different divisions. So you still got like first generation squat suits that provided a certain amount of support. So those records tend to go with like an asterisk because now we really go out of our way to separate them. But still those suits are nothing like the squat suits you see nowadays. I don't think they stack up to today's single ply squat suits, let alone the, the triple ply canvas monstrosities that you see. So regardless, uh, Hatfield, he was also a bit older. Um, Hatfield was a monster squatter. It's what he was known for. He was very explosive. He was known for being very, very explosive. And he was also a specialist. Uh, he was really known for being one of the first guys. I and mean, you guys think Louis Simmons was like the first guy to pull Soviet knowledge uh, into the United States and use it to help with making better training decisions. Hatfield was actually a PhD. Uh, he's actually written a lot. He has textbooks under his name. Uh, he's, I believe he spent some time overseas working with professionals over there, but he was heavily influenced by what the best science of the day was. And a lot of it came from the Soviet Union. So he's big on compensatory acceleration, again, playing into the fact that he was explosive, pushing as hard as you can on every heavy attempt. So in 1993, Fred Hatfield is 51 years old. He's a bit outside of his prime, but he's still very active. Uh, Tom Platt is younger, he's 38. So FIBO, they, they have this exhibition. They're gonna take these two legends of leg development and pit them against each other. So they're gonna have a max squat and then they're gonna have a squat for reps at a set weight. So they go into the max squat. This is where we get a little controversy. Fred Hatfield is universally credited with an 855. There isn't, there's only footage of Tom Platt's rep event. There doesn't seem to be footage available of the other attempts, but he's universally credited with an 855. Uh, Platt is credited with anywhere from a 600 to a 765, depending on what article you read. There was something I saw on Facebook. It looked like a quote of Hatfield's account of what happened. And he said Tom Platt squatted with seven plates or 765. Seven plates is 675. It makes sense to me that he just swapped the numbers that the 765 was actually a 675. I don't believe a 200 pound Tom Platts removed from, from his prime went to an exhibition and squatted 765. That's possible maybe. It's, out, it's outside of the realm of plausibility. Anyways, I'm comfortable giving him like a, a six to 675. 
it doesn't really matter because the point still stands, even if I give them the 765. My point is that when they dropped down and did this set for reps, Platts, who was obviously not as strong as Hatfield was, absolutely obliterated him in the squat, getting more than double the reps that Hatfield got. Again, there's some controversy Hatfield was credited with. I've heard 12 to 13. The first report I ever heard was 11. So we're talking low double digits anyways. This, the 23, we know that is the number because it's on video. You can watch it for yourself. It's very impressive, and it's not unlike a typical working set you would see from any bodybuilder who is focused on leg development. And it still represents a higher percentage. I mean, Hatfield's at 60% for his attempt. Tom Platt's low end to high end, it's 68 to 88%. Either way, it's still a higher percentage, and he got double the reps. So what does that tell us? We have two different modes of training, two different examples of the absolutely most elite specimens given these different training paths. And we can derive from that what the end result of specialization is. So over here, we have these curves. This is the curve of somebody who's very explosive. That would be Fred Hatfield. If we give him 855 at the top, that puts his 11 rep squat at around 60%. 60% for you or me tends to correspond with about a 20 rep max. That's typical for the average gym goer. Now, what, what can we assign that difference to? What, what is the cause of that difference? Could it be different training methodologies when you have somebody who's so fixated on breaking a world record that is entirely based on your power development, on your ability to express maximal strength? He likely just didn't spend as much time on other modes of training as the average gym goer would. Reps were probably lower, sets to failure at higher reps probably were very infrequent if they happened at all. It's also very likely, this is something you always have to consider when you're talking about the best in the world, that he was genetically predisposed to those traits. I actually have experience training a guy who fell in a similar category. This guy trained at our gym for about a year. He very quickly, he was a shorter guy, not a very big frame, very muscular though, very quickly got to a 600 pound squat and deadlift. For the life of me, I could not get him to do 405 for a set of five. Was it because he just didn't like reps? It was uncomfortable? Maybe. Was it because he had a genetic predisposition? Likely. It was also probably the marrying of the two. The fact that he just played further into his strength by avoiding the areas where he was weak. So you get this compounded effect of being weak at something and then opting to not do that and do the other thing anyways. So you just you separate that gap even wider by doing that. Up here, we have this best fit line just conceptually for what a uh, muscular endurance specialist would do. So for bodybuilding, for those of you that don't understand what bodybuilding training is, if you've never had the misfortune of actually working out with a true blue bodybuilder, do yourself a favor, go watch any bodybuilding video that's been released by Ronnie Coleman, you know, Blood and Guts with Dorian Yates, Branch Warren's training, any bodybuilder, go watch their training. Keep track of how much time is between each all out set. You're gonna find it's gonna be all out, minute rest, all out, minute rest. And for many of them, it's not even a minute rest. So in effect, on top of being training that causes muscular growth, it's basically like interval training. So that's why you see bodybuilders have not just really good muscular endurance because they're constantly working so much into those later rep ranges, but they're also walking around with a good amount of cardiovascular endurance. So because they're so biased, let's give Tom Platt to 675, which seems reasonable. It may even be lighter than that. But what we're looking at is his 23 reps is hanging up around anywhere between 70 and 80%, somewhere in that range. Again, for you or me, that usually corresponds with something like a five to eight rep max. And Tom Platt's got it out 23. That's just nonsensical. So as you see, this asymptote is just pushed further back where the kind of upper limit of what he's capable of doing, it's as the weight gets light, you're able to just go indefinitely. And you definitely see that. In fact, this line probably goes off a lot further. I've heard of bodybuilders being able to get into the 100 rep range on very light movements. So that it just goes to show how that line gets shifted further back as your ability to just regenerate substrates that you expend through training. It's just so high that it just happens so quick where if the weight's light enough, you can basically just go indefinitely. And that's the difference between being specialized. So what value is this in knowing the difference between the two? Obviously, both men were very muscularly developed. Both men were very strong by anybody's standards. The specialization is different. Now, again, just like Hatfield, we can talk about Tom Platt's having genetic predisposition, but there's no way around it. The way he trained was very unique. It, it, regardless of genetics, 
there was not a lot of people doing what he did, and there's no doubt that that was a response that that was responsible for the insane amount of muscle growth and ability that he had. So you can't really sleep on the training because everybody has. It's why we we weight train more than other things. Uh, strength and muscular endurance is very trainable. There's a lot of plasticity. There's a lot of room to get in there and interfere. Other traits like pure explosiveness, not so trainable. But you can always train to have a little more muscle, a little more strength and last a little bit longer. Those are very adaptable systems in the human body. So for most of us, we're either going through some amount of periodization where we are starting with high volume or rep work, where we're down in these later rep ranges at lower percentages, and then we steadily build up over time. The idea being that we widen out a base. When we're training over on this right shifted threshold, we are growing muscle. It's something that if, if you're not specialized towards, you're very sensitive to. So when you haven't done tens in a while, when you go do tens, you grow muscle very quickly. It widens your capacity base. It allows you to handle more work. So this is a problem with very explosive guys is that if you don't have a capacity, regardless of whether or not it's your competitive lean, if you don't have the capacity to make it through workouts, you're not going to work hard enough to be able to push that limit up. So this is why we concern ourselves with GPP. SPP is specific physical preparation. That's where we're sports specific. We're getting ready for contest day when we got to go at hundred percent. That's different. That's different than GPP general physical preparation is the base amount of, of fitness that you need to be able to make it through your workouts. A lot of you guys sleep on your general physical preparedness. A lot of guys don't have any capacity whatsoever. They're lazy with their workouts. They don't push their endurance thresholds very often, if at all. And what that means is that you're very limited on your capacity to train in the first place. You're pretty much limited to all out efforts with a ton of rest in between. So if we look at these as two different traits, two different qualities, you know, explosiveness, all out efforts versus longer sustained efforts, it brings up an interesting question. And that is how connected is this upper limit of strength expression with this foundation? You can run a thought model where, where would Fred Hatfield be as one of the most fully realized versions of sports specialization if he had this curve up and he had his base widened out? It's an interesting question. Would that have distracted him from really obtaining that upper echelon of sports specialization? Would he have been better for it? Would his base have widened and his ability to push the ceiling go up? Or would it have worked against his natural predisposition and physical strength? And would it have just distracted from achieving that high level? That's an interesting thought model. Similarly, with Platts, it makes you wonder that with this very high right shifted base, if he specialized more in strength, would that have meant that his ability to generate strength would have been much higher? If he spent less time developing this curve the way he did for his particular sport. Specifically when it comes to discussing strength, there are enough instances of people who are the absolute highest performers who are not specialized to the degree that someone like Hatfield was. If you look at World's Strongest Man, if you look at a lot of powerlifting legends, you see guys that were very big, very muscularly developed, especially in Fred Hatfield's era, there were a lot of guys that were really blatant about the fact that they liked reps. Kazmaier talked about liking reps. Doug Young liked reps. A lot of these bigger monster pressers and squatters built their body with a fair amount of work in this threshold. The principles of progressive overload still apply. People tend to interpret progressive overload as getting to the heaviest weight you can handle. It's not. It means you set your baseline and you build off of that. So if you're working in a tens threshold, you're trying to flesh out your ability to do tens. You grow muscle because of that. That helps eventually raise your base up, which lifts your ceiling and how high up you can go. Because I see enough people who are the highest possible achievers who grew into those numbers, it makes me think that even someone as specialized as Fred Hatfield might have left something on the table by not filling out his base wide enough. Now, if I could go back in time and coach Fred Hatfield, I am not willing to bet my life savings on that because now we're getting into a lot of variables and a lot of details. There's what sounds good and then there's what's good in practice. But no matter what, the odds that you are physically predisposed to having the qualities that a Fred Hatfield had is very, very low. Now you can also see how specialization can take a back seat if you are so well developed that you might even make up for lack of specialization. Someone like Tom Platt, who let's say he was at 200, maybe he was in the low 200s when he competed, you could see how a guy who is capable of this at his age and body weight, if you shift his body weight up, this is going to shift up with it. So you see how the ultimate conclusion is a 300 pound Ronnie Coleman doing an 800 pound squat, even though through all the years of training, strength was not a specialization. 
lifting heavy as a bodybuilder is not powerlifting. I've had a lot of people argue with me about that, that, oh, he was a powerlifter. It's like he, you dick around in a powerlifting meet in the early 90s and then spend the next 15 years becoming the most dominant bodybuilding champ in the world. It's not the couple of powerlifting meets you were dicking around in that led to that massive amount of strength as you weigh 100 pounds more. Okay, it's all the size you grew. It's all the bodybuilding training. Doing, you know, doing a heavy triple somewhere in your bodybuilding training is really secondary to the endless two and three hour long workout. That's, if we're trying to compare what had the biggest dent in your physical development, like it's not even close. Ultimately, what you guys are going to see if you try to specialize too early is you're going to be leaning more heavily into your genetic predisposition. You're also going to be trying to realize that ceiling, that hypothetical ceiling that you have off of a very narrow foundation. And this is the biggest problem I see with lifters. They try to specialize too early before they really have a wide enough base to specialize off of. You need a certain amount of muscle mass. You see, you need a certain amount of comfort and experience with the movement. You need a certain amount of experience before you can really get the most out of specialization. Hatfield, you're looking at somebody who trained for decades getting into this field. Olympic lifters overseas, you're looking at people who start very young. So by the time they're teenagers, they have way more physical mastery than pretty much any American teenager, Western teenager that you've met. Our training approach has to be different. We ultimately have to pad our training to make up for the lack of opportunity that we have or the lack of physical gifts that we have. So thanks for watching guys. I know that we kind of got in the weeds here. There's a lot to sink your teeth into, but understanding this as far as how the human body works is gonna help you get a handle on your own training and what types of things you should be doing and when it's appropriate to make maneuvers and changes. So we're always gonna be doing comparisons like this to give you an idea of what your best possible course of action is. If you have any questions, and I'm sure there will be, leave it in the comments. If you want more interaction, I'm getting to the point where I can't really respond to all the comments under the videos, so take it to the forum. There's a bigger discussion on the forum. It tends to be a little less manic and all over the place, and there's not so many trolls. So go ahead and sign up on the forum, empireforum.com. Thanks for watching, guys. Until next time, this is Bromley at Empire Barbell. I'll see you.